amazing audience we are live in LE like we've reached and the first person we've met in LE itself right is Christiana Morganrath am I correct about that Amanda Amanda is looking at me as though are we like we've been in LA like we're officially in LA we're right? officially in LA yeah mm -hmm. wonderful there we go Sometimes I make mistakes with that. Christiana, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Angel. Boom. Well, do tell us, which of your talents do you think is responsible for us connecting at this specific time in history? At this specific time in history? That's a great question. I would say my absolute passion for stand-up and podcasting is probably what connected mm. us. I see that you're a man who is endeavoring on a, an ambitious journey, an ambitious project. I myself am working on a show that I've been doing for two years now. Congratulations. Been, thank you very much. We've been recording uh, stories and stand-up sets from personal friends of mine, from stand-up comics, from storytellers throughout Los Angeles for two years now. Where did the idea for the podcast part come to connect that with? You know, I wish I had a great story about that, but I will say a friend of mine, we'd been doing the show actually in my living room when I first started it. We didn't have a venue, but I wanted to invite my friends over and said, I'll provide drinks if you guys come over and just tell some stories. I think this would be fun. And we were doing this for about six months before somebody said, when are you going to start recording this? Wow. And I said, uh, next show, <laughs> next month. Well, next month we'll be recording it for sure. Uh, and from there, I, I immediately messaged one of my friends from, uh, from high school, actually, who's a total audiophile and said, do you want to record a podcast together? <laughs> and that was it. Mm -hmm. So you, it's it, what is the six months included when you say two years and six months? Yes. Uh, uh huh. Uh, so it's been a podcast for a year and a half. Okay. Sweet. Mm -hmm. So who did you learn the skills of the comical side of what you do? Who did you learn that from? Mm, many people. Very many people. So my brother is my uh, oldest rival. I like to say he and I uh, definitely cut our teeth that kind of sibling rivalry and desire to always be the funniest in any situation and the ability to kind of cut tension also in any in any situation where like our mom was mad at us and my brother could make a joke and then she'd be like oh forget it <laughs> i was like okay we're going to be funny now all the time this is great i like this uh, so the two of us definitely uh, would try to impress each other and outdo each other at the dinner table and things like that just for, for our whole life, but now I'm taking um, improv classes at the Pack Theater on uh, Sunset Boulevard, on Hollywood all right, Boulevard. All right. Any ideas to go to Boston? I know there's a big Boston crowd that does improv. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are plenty of plenty of comedians I absolutely love. Bill Burr is one of them who's from the Boston scene. Plenty of people I love that have come from out there. I'd be more than happy to stop through, yeah. but it's not on the tour yet. All not right, on the tour all schedule right, yet. All right, all right. The tour. Uh, why will you continue to do uh, improv, even the comedy side of what you do, right? Now that you've been doing it, why will you continue to do it? It's important that we're represented, and by we I mean women. It really makes a difference. It's important to show up and just to tell our stories and the things that have happened to us and to be able to cut the tension of some of the things that we've gone through growing up and to be able to do that with grace and with comedy rather than to ne like necessarily always make a serious, dramatic situation out of that, you have this incredible ability to connect with people in a way that you can't always with drama. You can always connect with people when you can make them laugh. It's really true. That's 100% um, my in with people. And I think it's important both to share some of my own experiences and to get the voices of other people who are typically underrepresented in comedy and drama and film, television, and in that world and make sure that they have 10 minutes to talk. That's wonderful. Where's the best place for someone to connect with you that's looking? Well, you didn't say your name of your podcast, didn't you? The name of my podcast is Personally Speaking. All right, there we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right into the camera, like a good girl. Uh, personally Speaking, you can find it on iTunes. You can find it um, just about uh, plenty of places in the internet where you can listen to a podcast. You can find it there, Personally Speaking. Uh, you can also find it on Instagram if you want to get in touch with me, at It's Personal Now. Wonderful. What's one other thing you've done consistently over the last three years? Cry? No. Mm. <laughs> that could be true. Could be true. It's it's a valuable thing. Mm. I do think we have a weird, uh, uh, a strange stigma as as we get more comfortable talking about things like having panic attacks and um, mental health issues and the stigma around that has started to dissolve. I do think it's way more common for my friends and I to talk about crying 
Like someone, like uh, the other day, one of my friends, they just, we were talking in mid conversation. They said, I cried today. I was like, good for you. Mm. Great, good, <laughs> let's do more of that. How does it make you feel then when you do cry? There's this, it's the same thing. It's very strange, but there's a very similar direct parallel between laughing and crying mm. simply because both of those experiences are a, a release of tension. So when you have something that's been building and building, whether you're anxious about it, whether you're uh, excited about it, the ability to have that moment to release and to let go, that's huge. That's yeah. extremely important both in comedy and in our daily lives, in our emotional and interior lives. Laughing and crying. That's intriguing. Like, I never even thought about that. Like, I mean, I don't cry often. Cry more. Yeah. Cry more. Why would you suggest that someone that's listening do what you've done by combining emotions and definitely uh, functioning along the parallel of both? I think in my life, I can only speak to my experience, but in my life it has helped me be a better friend to other people. It's helped me check myself when I realize that you know a lot of the same um, feedback loops that I've been going around and unhealthy and unhelpful thought processes it helps me to kind of to realize like huh, it's really not ever as bad as I think it is and there's so many things that are worth worrying about but you absolutely have the ability to uh, to laugh about them to cry about them but I'm very familiar with just stuffing my emotions down and for a long time that was all I did but realizing that I could talk about them on stage and I could uh, not only cry but talk to my friends and be able to say like yeah it's absolutely fine to cry that's yeah. human that's part of the human experience was just like landmark for that's me wonderful. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. well let's switch gears for a moment let's let me it. now invite you into my time machine that is surrounded with beautiful warm blue Caribbean water love it what is your earliest childhood memory? It's funny that you say that. Uh, my earliest childhood memory was a little bit influenced by a little bit influenced by a photo that was on the mantle in my childhood home in Burbank, and it's a photo of me standing wearing this uh, tiny little red jumpsuit, standing next to uh, a giant poodle that is much taller than me. And this was my family's childhood, my, my childhood and family dog, uh, mm. one of two. And it actually turned out that my first word was not mom, it was not dad, it was dog. Uh, I think the word was doga, which is about as close as I got. Uh, and it's the first time, it's one of the first thing I remember is just walking through the garden of my childhood home with this giant protector who was my friend. And it's the coolest, it really is the coolest thing to think back on. That was really one of my first friends. And ever since throughout my entire life we've kept uh, that same kind of dog and it's always dogs have always been a part of my life how old way. were you in that picture mm, couldn't have been older than two why do you think that memory is so clear why it's so clear i think there is something to be said for the the way that when you like when you get told the story of some memory that you have and when you see the picture of some memory that you have you can kind of meld those together to some extent, it's going to be what you remember, but it's also influenced by what other people tell you about what happened. Yeah. You know? Can you connect the both memories, though? Can you connect that memory to who you are today? Absolutely. Tell me, how, how would you do that? Okay, so first of all, I still love dogs, right. so that's there a big one go. for me. Yeah. But it also speaks to the fact, uh, two, two important things, I guess, two important facts. One, that I was allowed to run free a lot, even if it was just in the backyard of my home. and. Um, I've been noticing a lot more, a lot more of the kind of helicopter parent and um, fearful kind of parenting take hold. And the second uh, is that somebody cared enough that just me wandering around the backyard with my dog was a valuable and precious thing to them. Yeah. And to me, that's wildly important. There were so many hard copy pictures of me and my brother around our house growing up, which to me suggests that not only was I cared for, but my brother and I were deeply loved, as were our family dogs, yeah. definitely. They were all a part of the family. Love it. Can I offer an interpretation to the thought picture? Hit me. I love the idea of you keeping a space for friendship. Yeah. And now you're doing that with the podcast. Mm -hmm. Where I mean, people are coming in, some bigger than you, some smaller than mm -hmm. you. Yeah, but you're keeping a space 
for that friendship to occur. That is beautiful. I like that. Yeah. Well done. It's the good stuff. It's the good stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can fast forward it to when you were 12. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite song? Ooh, ooh. Okay, when I was 12 years old, I'm going to say, I'm going to go all in and say, Sugar, We're Going Down by Fall Out Boy. All right, there we go. I liked a lot of <laughs> pop punk music, folks. A lot of pop punk music. But we have arrived at our destination. But before mm -hmm. we get off of this time machine, yes. there's a small declaration form. Yes or no? We're going to move pretty quickly. Are you ready? Yes. Have you chosen someone to pass on your skills to, Christiana? Not yet. Are you married? Not yet. Do you have children? Nope. Do you believe in God? Maybe. Do you have an inner circle of friends? Absolutely. Do you watch TV for more than three hours a day? Two. All right. What about screen time, the phone and or the computer? More than eight or less than eight hours a day? Less than eight. If you had to share with us your own unique real statement, a statement that represents who you are, what would you say that is? Everything takes longer than you think it will. That is true. <laughs> That's true it. both in like your day to day, like just trying to find a parking spot yeah. and Ooh. in just the life things, you know? Yeah. I don't know, like go moving through your 20s. Everything takes longer than you think it will. <laughs> trying to find a parking spot. Everything takes longer than you think I it will. I love it. I love it. It's the truth. You're amazing. Before we leave, is there anything else you'd like to share with our amazing audience?